my talk is about habitat corridors, and I should declare that um, I'm re relatively new to this area of expertise, if you like. Um, I was first alerted, well, I first became aware of the need for them, um, because about four, four years or so ago, uh, we, I live in Berrimah, and we became aware of the increasing industrialization of the so-called enterprise zone. And uh, <clears throat> so we at that stage had a forewarning of the Austral Shell Quarry, uh, which was uh, going to lead on to the Austral Brickworks and the Austral Masonry Plant. So that was all going to be opposite the Boral Cement Works. And so um, the Resident Association nominated me to join the Boral and the Austral. Each of them have community consultation committees, so I joined them. And that's been very, very useful actually because it's allowed me to have an insight into what their future plans are and to try and change the culture, and it has been changing. So, um, yeah, so I'm not an expert, but um, I'm learning a lot. Now, the first question, I guess, is what are habitat corridors? And they're pretty, the term habitat corridor is pretty self explanatory in the sense that it's a corridor which connects other larger habitats. And um, basically, there are avenues of habitat um, which allow um, connections with, for the different species to move between the, the significant habitats. And those significant habitats tend to be national parks, uh, rivers, and uh, major reserves. So it's really important to, to connect those. And, <clears throat> and uh, we, we need that, those connections to maintain biodiversity through um, stopping the genetic, um, the genome deteriorating within more limited areas. And also, one of the things that with habitat corridors, they invariably involve trees, and trees provide canopy, and the canopy allows the movement of birds around the shire. But smaller birds particularly won't go across large areas. You need those canopies in corridors to allow them to, to travel safely. Birds are very important because they distribute seeds. So wherever you get birds, you get plants cropping up, as, you, as you're probably aware. Now, habitat corridors also have several ancillary benefits, and, and they act as windbreaks and dust filters, and the dust filters are particularly important around the enterprise zone, um, because the dust, the, the winds, uh, generally are westerly winds, but occasionally they're easterly and, and northerly and southerly, and this enterprise zone actually has um, it's in close proximity to Mosvale, Baradu, Barrel, and Berrima, New Berrima. And uh, the Austral and Boro both are dust creating, they, they create a lot of dust. And uh, <clears throat> dust actually is not good for your health, it's certainly not good for the wildlife's health. Um, but so there's a need for that just alone to filter dust. And I think Austral and Boro are aware of that. And so they are now coming around to support the notion of habitat corridors. <clears throat> now in the urban context, in a sense, streets can become habitat corridors, certainly for bird life. And um, so the first uh, thing I'd like to show is the impact of, of heat in the city. And you'll see these, these are both taken in glebe, and the, the one on the left shows the impact of heat. Uh, heat is shown by the red or the orange. And you'll see the impact of heat without a tree canopy is quite severe. On the right, you have another part of Glebe which has got the tree canopy. And it's, it's really quite a difference in the impact on the local environment. So, um, now this became an issue. In, I was aware of this back in the late 90s and um, I'm a great fan of Clover Moore. And, Clover Moore um, had this concept of the urban forest. And so my partner and I were living in Darlinghurst in East Sydney, and we took it upon ourselves to map every tree in East Sydney, and then we discovered that actually you could double the canopy. And Clover Moore took us up on this, and she did. She doubled the canopy. And now 20 years later, when you go through Darlinghurst in East Sydney, it's a sort of beautiful dapple shade, sound of birds, it's a transformation. So it's not just in the rural that you have these corridors. Now, one of the basic questions is how wide should the, should the corridor be? And in this context, I'm talking about the rural environment. And um, I was at a field day in Wairai about a month or so ago, and Charles Massey, who's a consultant to the property, um, was there, and he was part of the on-site visits, 
And I asked him, how wide should the habitat corridors be? And he said, the current thinking is 30 to 35 meters. That's a sort of minimum, if you like. <clears throat> now, it may not always be possible because, uh, particularly on private land, where the landowner is often reluctant to commit this much land to sort of rewilding, but it's a useful um, rule of thumb. Uh, Charles explained that the width of 30 to 35 meters gives sufficient canopy cover um, to protect the wildlife within those corridors from predators, particularly um, for birds, who are, who are, um, if you have some predatory birds, I suppose, it gives them that protection. So um, now with wombats, wombats, uh, they, they, gender, they like riparian zones, and we've been stripping the vegetation off riparian zones in the highlands. So by restoring the, the canopy and the vegetation to those riparian zones, you're, you're actually encouraging the wombats to pretty well keep their burrows under the canopy. They, they prefer not to have burrows in the open, but they will of course, but, um, but generally it would help the wombats and uh, lower their potential damage, if you like, uh, if you have this canopy and uh, habitat corridor. So the, having got the width and the location, uh, you ask yourself, what sort of vegetation should we be putting in? And um, as we've heard uh, from um, Robbie and, and Lou, uh, particularly Robbie, uh, it takes a long time to re rewild an area. We can put in the trees, but the trees have to grow, and then you have to have the middle story. You have, you have the mid, mid story and lower story. Um, but I just wanted to talk about, um, these are the, uh, Austral, I'll get onto the board in a minute, but these are the, um, this is the Austral land, and you'll see uh, up here is um, where the, the top part with the blue running through it, that's where the quarry is going to be, and it's going to be a big quarry. And it's actually very, it's not right on the river, but it's sufficiently close to the river to cause some concern. In the, um, in the town planning town planning laws for, for the Shire, you have three levels of riparian zone. You have category one, which is the red, and that's where the Winterkaribu River is. And that's, you're not supposed to develop 50 meters on either side of that um, riparian zone. So Austral, realizing it can't develop that close anyway, they're, they're, they're actually now uh, coming around to the idea of revegetating the, the riverbank and uh, after myself, we'll have um, Patrick Taggart and Ian Rayner from Greening Australia talking. And Ian's uh, with Greening Australia. And so together, um, our group and Greening Australia have now persuaded uh, Austral to revegetate the river, the, the riverbank. At, at the moment, it's completely bare between the new Barramawea and Baradu. Uh, the cattle have been going into the river and just creating a, like a mud bath. <coughs> So this will actually restore that riverfront, and we're hoping to extend the platypus habitat uh, by, <clears throat> by doing that. Uh, then you've got the category two, which is the lime green, and you know, you're not supposed to build or develop 30 meters on either side of that. Um, we were able to get, as a condition of consent, to the austral masonry plant, which is going to be down uh, this lower sort of triangular piece. That's going to be the masonry plant and the new brickworks. Um, but there's a riparian zone uh, which runs along Stony Creek, and that's the lime green that goes through that uh, uh, triangle. So Austral's agreed to um, a 40 metre wide uh, revegetation, rewilding. Um, so we're making progress, but it's slow. And if you, if you think dealing with government bureaucracies is, is bad and cumbersome, you should try dealing with major corporations, bureaucracies, um, because they're as, as complex and resistant to change, but they've also got the profit motive. <clears throat> this, is for, this is the Boral land, and you'll see on the left is the larger aerial view, and the long-term project is to uh, connect the two riparian zones, Stony Creek and Oldbury Creek on the left, and so to have a boundary, a boundary habitat corridor which will take you up to uh, the western side of the Boral property. And fortunately, where that western side finishes is an old railway track. Uh, 
um, used to connect the cement works with the Midway coal mine. The Midway coal mine, as you know, is now closed permanently, um, but they've left the, the railway line. And last year, the drought was so bad that um, for the first time, Boral had to, they, they didn't, there did, was not enough water in the river for them to use their water rights. So they had to truck in water, and cement works use a lot of water. <laughs> so um, it became a bit of a crisis for them, and so they've decided there's a long-term solution. They will use the railway line as a pipeline to take water flowing out of the mine back to Berrima, um, to the cement works. And they'll be treating the water at the mine site, so we're not getting polluted water um, coming back into the, the district. Um, but it occurred, I was on the, um, Boral have a Boral Colliery Closure Committee. That's required by the Department of Planning. Um, so uh, the day that they announced they were going to use the railway line <coughs> for the pipeline, I said, well, this would make a great habitat corridor because it goes under the freeway. And it means then that the wildlife has, has a much safer route back to the, to the national park. And at first there was some resistance, but now they've come around um, to support that, uh, in theory. It's still a process to get it approved, uh, if you like, at the higher, <clears throat> the higher levels. But it's part of a long-term scheme. And I told you before about <clears throat> the Austral land with Stony Creek. And you'll see that the green, green right there in the zone comes across the on road and into the Boral land. And so we're going to get this habitat corridor on um, the, start, the start of the, the, the major Boral um, scheme, if you like. So um, now just getting back to um, uh, how, how we sort of do this in practice, um, you need volunteers, you need the native plant stock, you need fencing, you need um, protective uh, protection around each of the plants. And so we're working with um, the local land care groups, um, local land services, and the national parks. And um, this is something that Pat Hall was involved with, and Pat's going to talk um, later. But um, about 20 volunteers went out about six weeks ago, and we were planting koala, <coughs> koala habitat trees. So, um, yeah, you get some fresh air. I just talked very briefly about the, the environment levy. This guy is very fortunate to have uh, <coughs> a dedicated environment levy, but we've discovered in the recent year or so that the levy as a percentage of general rates uh, has dropped considerably. It started 20 years ago, 4.51%, and now it's down to 2.5%. So in the, in the, um, the major rate rise that we've uh, had over the, <clears throat> the last four or five years, um, that, that was a rate rise of 45%, and none of that was uh, given to the environment. Um, so it's a challenge. Another challenge is the impact of climate change. And these habitat corridors take decades to get established. So what we're planting now won't really um, be of much use until about 30 years time, probably. Uh, 20 or 30 years time. <clears throat> and uh, as you saw from Lou's uh, slides, um, you really need those decades to bring, to bring the land back. So that's... Um, now, the, um, the other threat, if you like, to the, to the environment in the Shire is suburban growth and uh, the heavy industry moving in. And um, I think that's a worry, but we need to start preparing for it. So all through the Enterprise Zone, we really need a master plan to rewild the riparian zones. And this shows the koala, the map of the koala habitat. And as you can see, the potential habitat area is quite large. Um, uh, but as uh, Charlotte and Thelma will, will tell you, um, it's not, not quite as prevalent of, uh, in terms of the actual koalas as, as the, the map might show. From my perspective, I'd like to see the start of a habitat corridor actually in an urban environment. And this is um, the East, East Barrow or Riparian Zone that runs along Mittagong Creek. And you might be aware of it when you go to East Barrow. It's sort of grassy banks, um, but very few trees. So I think that should be uh, rewilded, revegetated, 
and that could be the starting point for uh, connections to other, uh, through other corridors. The, what, the picture on the left is really where you can have the start of the east barrel, which is in the, the lower part of, um, of the screen over here, and then you connect it back to the, to the right, into the major national park uh, on the coast, and then going up north, you would go through Mount Gibraltar, and then into the upper halt and the lower halt of, of Frenchman. And then uh, if we can get it uh, rewilded um, from the lower halt past the maltings, they cleared all the vegetation, but we need to get that reintroduced. I think it should be a condition of consent uh, for the maltings development. And then the challenge is to get it over the Old Hume Highway um, onto the Mount Alexandria and then the National Park uh, beyond that. All these are obstacles, but they're not insurmountable. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention was the particular issue with Frencham. Now, Frencham has a very long and proud tradition of being environmentally aware, and it's always been part of their education program. But for some odd reason, a year or so ago, um, the, I think it was the um, the finance people in French uh, struck on the idea of a so-called echo village, which would be put in the middle of the lower hold. And that's, the lower hold is an incredibly important pinch, pinch point in the habitat corridor. And um, they were proposing to bull, bulldoze over the Wombat uh, Wisdom or Colony and fell 250 trees. And it just doesn't make sense. So we've, um, there's now a new headmistress and um, we're making approaches to, to talk to her. Um, I'm hoping that they'll listen, but there was a huge public outcry and it was enough to make the council defer the decision. So we're on the winning side, I think. Um, we just need to offer something that gives fringe what they want, but also protects uh, the wildlife. <coughs> so, um, Look, I think I won't sort of say too much more. It's, um, it's a work in progress and um, we need the public support. But I think we also need the public support to raise the environment levy back up to three, four, five percent, probably four or five percent, because we're facing huge environmental challenges and uh, we've got a fantastic team at council, but they need funding. So, all right, look, I'll finish there.